Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Yeah, so we're winding things down here. Yes, indeed we are. We are still in 1486, almost uh, to the end, although of course Dawnbringer ends in 1600, so uh, we're going to take a huge leap at the end of everything that's here. And then, you know, like I know that Timeless is slated to come out in what, November, I think, and everything, but... As of right now, it seems like Salvatore is the only person on the docket, so I don't know. I might uh, come back one day and uh, do more if, you know, they ever sign up other people to write more novels, but for the most part, I think I will probably be done once we're through with everything up to the release of Hero or Death Masks. We're skipping all Salvatore, so I'm done with Salvatore. And uh, we're also done with Erin Evans, which is kind of sad. Erin Evans is, I, like, I think she's a good writer. And if you like her stuff, you're going to love everything that she's done. I really, really liked the first Brimstone Angels novel. And it's frustrating to me that they didn't work for me after that one. The big reason is it it turned into more of a soap opera. And it's weird because I like... Uh, things that draw on soap opera, uh, Twin Peaks, for example. I love that. I love the way that they use the kind of format of a soap opera to tell a very different tale. But I don't like actual soap opera itself, where people keep repeating things ad infinitum, and where things happen at a glacial pace. And I'm like, I just I want something to happen. Like, I was really digging the first uh, part of... um. What was the one that came right before this? Not Lesser Evils. It was the one in between Lesser Evils and Fire in the Blood. Whatever. Anyway, yeah, it's it's, uh, and, and then it just slowed down so much, and it was so frustrating. And this one, I just kind of skipped through, and it was kind of like, meh. I mean, it it like one of the first scenes is uh, what's his name, Mahendran, um, their dad, uh, the the Tiefling's dad, kind of teaching them stuff, and it just goes into this long diatribe about what it means to be a father, and it's like we've we've done this already, we've been here, we've done this. It's not interesting. It it doesn't uh, make me feel anything one way or the other about any of the characters, and so you know, let's just let's just keep moving if we could. But for whatever reason, it keeps bogging down and stuff like that. And the whole political action wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And so I was just kind of like, oh, hum. Anyway, like I say, it's, it's, if, if you digged, uh, if you digged, if you dug <laughs> uh, lesser, lesser evils, then you are for sure going to like the rest of them because it is more and more and more of that. It's so frustrating because I want, uh, I, I don't want to like, I, I find the whole, um, the, the political devil stuff, uh, very interesting, uh, but instead it's just kind of, um, again, soap opera. It, it, go, it moves so slowly, in my opinion, that I, I just it couldn't hold my interest. But uh, again, like I say, if, if you dug lesser evils, then keep going, because it there just is way more of the same. And so, you know, like there's uh, there are things that I enjoy that I'm sure other people don't, and like if the next book or movie of that comes out at like three hours or seven million pages then i'm gonna be excited even if nobody else really cares so yeah done with that but um i i do recognize that erin has a lot of talent and i would be curious to see what she did unrelated to the realms i have no idea if she's come out with anything since the end of the realms i've been somewhat following kemp and denning but they're doing stuff where I'm like, you know, like uh, Kemp's doing a lot of Star Wars, Denning did a lot of Star Wars, and now he's over to Halo. And I'm like, I'm vaguely curious about that, but not super curious, I guess. I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, I have read uh, far too many Star Wars books uh, to be proud of, and that's just because for a long time that was kind of most of the kind of genre fiction on the shelves, right? And... Back in the day, uh, my best friend loved Star Wars, and so I tried to kind of get into it for to have more to talk about with him, even though I didn't enjoy much of it. A few standout books, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, point being, I've read a lot of those, but I don't really care for them. I read one of Kemp's, uh, or at least I tried to, and I got about halfway through it, and I was like, this is friggin' ridiculous. Like, I just I had, I had to put it down. Um, and that was really frustrating, because in general, I love Kemp so much. But I haven't gone back because of that. 
And Denning's stuff was really hit or miss. Like, there were some things where I was like, yeah, this is cool, and other things where I'm like, what the hell, were you just filling out pages here? And with Halo, I just feel like, I don't know, I guess I have read some Halo that I enjoyed. Um, I, I started reading it just for the hell of it, and I really liked the Nyland books, but I'm also like, god damn, dude, like, we've got like 18 or 20 Halo books out there. There's probably enough Halo books, but... Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I, I would really be interested to see these people do their own stuff, like Paul Kemp's uh, Egil and Nick stuff. I, I've only read the first one so far, but I really enjoyed it and look forward to reading the rest of it at some point. Which does kind of bring up uh, what I might do after this, if anything. I've got one project that's way on the back burner. It's been on the back burner for like a year and a half, but I think it's finally gaining some traction now. I'll look for something very different coming out in maybe about six months. Something else I I'm really tempted to do, but I'm not 100% sure if I could pull it off or not. But we'll see. Curious to see what people think. Through the years, I've had people suggest a few things, and I've been um, kind of torn one way or the other on them, but I'd be curious to see if any of the listeners right now are like, oh yeah, you should do this or whatever, or if everybody just kind of hates me at this point and is in it just to see if I make it through. Uh, I know that the negative comments can be fast and furious, so let's give them more ammunition. Let's finish off the Sundering, and boy... Um, I'll just say it right now. I was really whelmed. Is it? Is it? I can't remember. Whelmed does mean either over or under, but I can't remember which one it means. Uh, I was really underwhelmed here. So the, uh, you know, so I was excited to see some of the authors come back and everything, and I was just like, God, why did you bother, guys? Like, Paul Kemp's was a little rushed, but for the most part, I really, really dug uh, Godborn. But I think I just got tired of the conceit of the Sundering really fast, which was essentially like all of the gods have superheroes. And it it was like, okay, I mean, like, Mistra has had Chosen forever, so, I mean, fine, whatever, everybody gets some Chosen now. But the Chosen of them didn't seem that different from the regular ones. Let's talk about Reaver first. Reaver uh, isn't isn't bad. Uh, it isn't terrible. Uh, the main problem comes from the fact that um, essentially, I don't know, somewhere around maybe 15 or 20 percent into the story, the story just starts repeating itself on and on and on again until about 80 percent through where, bam, the, the child who was meant to be saved is saved and uh, the bad guy is finally defeated. Um, it's like we fight him on land, then we fight him at sea, then we fight him half on land and half at sea. And, and it's like, oh my god, dude, just friggin' die. And finally at 80%, it's like, okay, he's dead. And, uh, and, and, and we've got the child here, and then like a, uh, a ritual of nature is performed, and the kid like, I don't know, I think he gives away his powers to, like, plant a crop or something, and it's and it's all about the rebirth of, um, how I want to say Lathander, I don't know, I get all the damn gods mixed up, <laughs> they're so, so damn many, and I actually, like, with 4th edition, I was kind of like, okay, yay, some of them went away, and then with Godborn, Mask came back, but I guess I kind of saw that one coming from so far away, because he kind of did the same thing for 3rd edition, you know, hiding in the sword and everything, so that didn't really surprise me as much, though I, I think I forgot to mention uh, one of my big complaints with that book was the fact that Erebus is brought back, and it's like, why? Like, it served no purpose in the story. Like, it really did nothing. Like, he's there for, like, 20 pages, beats up a dude who they uh, missed in editing, and he gets called the other dude's name, and then basically just is hanging out with his kid, and it's like, Okay, I mean, I guess that's nice that it got a happy ending, but it really seemed unnecessary. And I don't know, maybe maybe uh, Kemp literally wrote like the first part of Godborn and there was more to it that he had planned to do with that. And he was like, well, this is a good enough place to end it at least. Uh, and Erebus's <laughs> rebirth will just seem a little pointless, uh, but, you know, still whatever. You know, that, that, that's my uh, problem with the gods coming back, is it's like, um, who cares, really, you know? I mean, like, what does it matter? It's like, it, it feels, a lot of this feels as if, like, I don't know, like, um, like the opposite of when you see a guest star you really like show up on a show you like, you know what I mean? Like, there, it's like, oh, yeah, cool, like the friggin', what's his name, like the jester or whatever is back on Supernatural this week. Yay, I love that actor, and he brings so much energy to it, and there's always a fun time, and, 
yada, yada, yada. Um, and instead, it's kind of like, oh, I brought that back so that really 4th edition was totally meaningless. I still enjoy a hell of a lot of what happened in 4th edition, and so I, um, as kind of silly and pointless as a lot of it was, I admire the ballsiness of it, and so I guess it makes me a little sad that we're just kind of, oh, never mind, we're trying to hand wave a hundred years of history, basically. But it was handled badly, whatever, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna argue that point. So, with the Reaver... It's Richard Lee Byers, so you know what that means, kids. It is vocabulary time. Clepsidrus. Clepsidrus. This means water clock. It's a word for a timekeeping device powered by water. Clepsidrus. I'll never remember that. You probably won't either. But if you're one of the many people out there working on a fantasy novel, it will probably come in handy at some point. Clepsidrus. Starts with a C. Look it up. I also highlighted a couple of other lines. I don't particularly remember why. <laughs> oh, I know the first one. The first one is because over on uh, um, Faroon History, I was reading this right at the same time that I recorded the um, the Church of Bane advertisement. And, uh, and, and so I thought this was funny. One of the characters says, I like to think I'm a good Baneite overall, but I confess to a preference for mercy within the bounds of practicality. I, I thought that was nice because, you know, with the kind of advertisement that we did over on uh, Faroon History, it was sort of part of the point was, you know, Bane is one thing and he stands for all these things, but not every believer gets into it because they're like, yay, murder, right? And so I, I thought that was an interesting sort of point to make about how followers of Bane view things in different ways. And of course, his 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 idea of mercy is, is totally different than what you or I would probably think of. And so it's kind of a... Uh, an ironic statement in the end, but anyway. Uh, the other note that I made, which, again, I don't really remember why uh, or what this meant or even who it was talking about. Maybe I just thought it was fun sort of overwriting here. Or maybe the violence was in her smile, all but unbearable with an infinite love of ruin. <laughs> essentially this whole book I just felt like could have been a short story and didn't do much. Oh, and then I forgot to mention after like the corn grows or whatever, we fight the dude who we thought we killed again. This book just I could not think of a plot and was like, I'll throw this shark dude at him again, I guess. Yeah, it, it just, uh, it didn't do much for me. And the sundering just seemed, I, I mean, it's like we talk about the wars going on a lot, but they're not really on screen, and I don't remember them being uh, the focal point for any adventures or anything. So it seems like a really odd way to uh, uh, to switch editions, but whatever. I mean, you know, I like I don't hate it. I just I'm kind of confused by it. So let's move on to the Sentinel by Troy Denning, number five in the Sundering. This one, I was so frustrated at, but I was like, I am going to give it till 20%. 20%, and then I am giving up on the end of that chapter if something doesn't hook me. <laughs> and by God, <laughs> just I'll, I'll, I'll say it in a moment. Before that, there's this line, if the kingdom fell, the netheries would claim all of Faroon, perhaps all of Toril. And it's like, oh, oh, shit, that's interesting. I want to know what's going on there. There's been this whole kind of... In the background plot, it, it was more in the foreground in Godborn, of course, because they uh, were dealing with Rivalin. But there's been this in the background plot of, um, oh, what's his name? Ta Tal Talaman? Shit. Uh, Tanthal? Tanthal? The, uh, the father of Rivalin and uh, uh, the one who starts with a B. Damn it, I am so horrible with names. He's leading um, uh, the Netherese on this kind of uh, power mad, power grab for a, a, a lot of. Faroon, and so I was like, oh, this this will be exciting and interesting, and it doesn't really happen in this book, and uh, that sucked, but we'll get into why in a little bit here. Anyway, oh, you, you know, though, first let's talk about, let's talk about our basically main character. He's a paladin named Cleef. Now, in general, I don't really care about names. Sometimes names are just perfect, and you're like, oh, yeah, I really like that name, and I can remember it easily, and it fits, and it doesn't sound too ridiculous. Cleef, in my head, every single time that I read it, I heard Queef, because it is so close, and because my mind is run by a seventh grader at all times. 
This did not make for an enjoyable read. It made for an annoying read the entire way through. Troy. Never name a main character something that sounds so close to Queef. All right, rant over. Anyway, Cleef is a uh, paladin of, I want to say Helm. It's one of the dead gods, and I think Helm is dead or was a mortal for a while. Was he the guy at the end of the uh, Empyrean Odyssey who was like, ah, he just decided to become a human and join like an adventuring party or something? I, I think that might have been him. In any case, he follows this god, and he's like the head of a town watch, and people kind of, the guys on his watch kind of mock him for it, for being so strict and following the rules and everything. And everybody seems to be like, why do you follow this dead god? And all he ever does is kind of like grunt unhappily in response. And I'm like, okay, this is so friggin' ridiculous, you know? It's like, in our society, we have a lot of people who follow a god who doesn't show up on a daily basis to say, hey, follow my rules or I shall smite you, right? I mean, like, whether you believe in God or not, you have to admit that he doesn't make an appearance very often. You know what I mean? Beyond that, we have people who follow, like, say, uh, the Jedi uh, rule, you know? There are these people who, like, dress like them and follow that code. We have people who follow the Star Trek code, knowing that they're fiction, but because they believe in those codes and what they stand for so much that it means something to them to the point that they're willing to stand out a bit from society to show that that's where their inner moral code lies. So the idea of someone following a god who died, like, just a couple of generations ago and announcing that to the world, and, like, that doesn't seem that crazy to me. Like, maybe some good-natured ribbing, sure, but for the most part, I don't think his response would be, ugh, and turning away angrily. I think it would be like, well, I just really admire what Helm stood for, and I want to incorporate those rules into my daily life, and whether you follow them is your choice, but yada yada yada. And instead, it's, ugh, and he turns away and is annoyed. So, I did not like Cleef, and apparently uh, at least a sequel was planned, because I found, when I went to Troy's site, I, th I think it's on his site, where I was trying to find out what he's been doing since, and found out it was Halo, I saw um, uh, an ad for, like, Queef back at it again, fighting something else in a, in a sequel book, and I'm like, pretty sure that never came out. So that sucks, that... Um, a lot of these guys were making deals, apparently, and they all kind of fell through at some point. Who knows? Maybe we'll see that again, whether it's in that form or not. Like, for instance, I know Elaine Cunningham has a couple that, you know, people have been waiting for forever, and it's like they might not even work anymore, but, man, I would love to see what she would do these days with, uh, with the world. The thing that happened at 21% before I got out of that chapter was... Somebody pointed out the spy's name was the same as that of the Seraph of Lies who had served Sirik the Mad a hundred years earlier. And I was like, oh shit, I didn't even notice this character was Malak. And yes, Malak is here and is a character and hangs out with Sirik every now and then. And I was so excited about this. But Malak was really dull in this book. Really, really dull. He's just a foil. That's it. He's nothing more. And he just comes across as bratty and annoying. And it's like... I don't even think he's under the truth spell anymore because there are a couple of things that he says where I'm like, no, that's patently just false, and he knows it. Yeah, so I stuck in it for some Malik fun times and really didn't get him. It's mostly just him being like, meh, 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 meh. Oh, and we have a love triangle, and I was like, oh, Denning, can you pull it off again? Can you put a poly relationship into this? And no, um, what was interesting is it kind of turned into a, lesbian is the wrong word, because I'm pretty sure both of them are bi, but it does turn into a F slash M, or uh, sorry, F slash F relationship, and so that was kind of cool, and like, nobody really cared about that, and so that was also kind of cool, you know, it was like, uh, it was like, oh, well, uh, uh, because, because essentially one of the characters is the, um, the chosen of, um, oh, God, not... Not Saloon, uh, the goddess of beauty. Um, soon, 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 the goddess of beauty and or the goddess of love, and um, she has to get another character to fall in love with her and make a sacrifice. And so it's like Malik keeps trying to push for it to be Cleef, 
Queef is like, no, like, you're stupid. Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, you know, she, I'm a commoner, yada, yada, yada. And there's like this whole, as I say, like this whole love triangle thing. One of the problems with the love triangle is I kept getting the two women mixed up because I think one was a noble and one was like a princess or something. And I just, I, it was towards the very end before I finally was like, okay, this one is that. It just took too long to click. Like, the characters were too much alike. I don't even remember how the sacrifice ended. I just didn't care by that point. Whatever. I think I think Malik gets knocked into, like, a maw of unending torment or some silliness or whatever. And that was the other thing. Like, Cyric's two times that he showed up were so underwhelming. Everything was just so underwhelming. And I felt like, Troy, what are you... Are you just writing words to fill space here? That's what it felt like. It felt like, eh, I mean, I guess it's a paycheck. I, You know, like... It didn't, I don't know, maybe I'm being too harsh, but I expected something more. I expected people to come in and make a big blast with what might be their final Realms novel. And I felt like Kemp really did that, you know? I felt like he was like, F it, I'm going to go balls to the wall, and hopefully this will get me more contracts and more money. And I felt like Troy and By- or, uh, Denning and Byers were both kind of like, eh, at least I showed I tried. Anyway... At 30% in the book, we got the line, Abir and Toril are separating. And it's like, all right, so that finally is just spelled out here. Because I assumed that's what the Sundering was about, but I haven't seen it talked about or mentioned until that point. There's no real reason why that I saw or how it's happening. Is it related to the Netherese? I, who knows? Also, at 31%, we get an explanation of why the MacGuffin is needed. And I was like, okay, they explained it, and I still don't friggin' get it. Shar is tricking Grumbar into leaving Toril, and it has fallen to us to change his mind. And that is what the eye is for. All right, okay, I mean, I guess, sure, it's a reason for things to happen. Then we also get this line, anybody else the eye would corrupt, because uh, Malak's carrying the eye. It's like a, it's, it's the eye for the evil ogre god, or not, maybe not ogre, orc, orc god. Anybody else the eye would corrupt, but Malak, he already stands on that side of the temple. I thought that was a really good line. He stands on that side of the temple for somebody who's evil. Like, I thought that was nice. That was a, a good in-game way to explain somebody being evil, uh, but following a god. Following an evil god would be an easier way to say that. Whatever. Happy Fourth of July! I am still doing these on <laughs> holidays. I don't know what that is. Anyway. Also, that heavily reminded me of Lord of the Rings, and then just a little while later, we get the image of Treants on the march, and I was like, oh yeah, it's the Ents coming. I don't even like Lord of the Rings. I have seen one and a half of the movies, like, that's how much I care about it, and uh, I, I saw the first one because I loved Peter Jackson, you know, um, uh, Meet the Feebles and Heavenly Creatures. Heavenly Creatures is one of my favorite films ever, and so I was like, oh, I can't wait to see how he friggin' eviscerates this stupid piece of crap fantasy BS. And I was like, oh, I, I guess he liked it? Because this is really, really just this feels kind of like the book. So I was pretty let down, so I didn't, uh, didn't watch much more of it after that. Anyway, um, I'm sure a few people out there will disagree with me. Point being, there are some, uh, for sure, Lord of the Rings imagery pieces in here, but in the end, it's just like, oh, they trick a head giant or something i don't know it just felt whatever i mean it was like okay more grist for the mill and very quickly let's talk about the last one the herald by ed greenwood i was really hoping this would be a greenwood one that i would like and instead i was again just really bored it's like oh look everybody from the old stories is still alive somehow and blah 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 and still doing their thing and in the end uh, because i skipped to the end because i was just kind of like do we get like the netherese some sort of closure there and yes indeed uh elminster kills tantamus tantalus tantamon tant teramon tantathon he kills he kills the netherese bad guy who's trying to ram a city into somewhere i think and um uh, so another um uh, the last uh, shade uh, the last shade enclave crashes to the ground and uh, tantathantamus dies and huzzah i was like okay i guess got my closure i'm i'm glad about that i guess you know i feel bad because i am just so not enjoying most of fourth and fifth edition and it's like 
Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting side effect. I'm just going on forever here. I'm sorry, but I'll tell you an interesting side effect. I am getting curious to try reading some of the second edition ones that I skipped because I just wasn't into them. Like Soldiers of Ice, even though the writing style wasn't meant for me, I'm like, God, what happened there? I'm really curious. <laughs> so I guess that's something good, right? Anyway, until next time, Clepsidra. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.